Chapter 1. Acquiring Confidence Before an Audience Students of public speaking continually ask, How can I overcome self-consciousness and the fear that paralyzes me before an audience? Face an audience as frequently as you can. You can never attain freedom from stage fright by reading a treatise. A book may give you excellent suggestions on how best to conduct yourself in the water, but sooner or later you must get wet, perhaps even strangle, and be half scared to death. There are a great many wetless bathing suits worn at the seashore, but no one ever learns to swim in them. To plunge is the only way. Practice, practice, practice in speaking before an audience will tend to remove all fear of audiences, just as practice in swimming will lead to confidence and facility in the water. You must learn to speak by speaking. All we can do here is to offer you suggestions as to how best to prepare for your plunge, the real plunge no one can take for you. A doctor may prescribe, but you must take the medicine. Do not be disheartened if at first you suffer from stage fright. For one reason or another, some master speakers never entirely overcome stage fright, but it will pay you to spare no pains to conquer it. One way to get air out of a glass is to pour in water. Be absorbed by your subject. If you feel deeply about your subject, you will be able to think of little else. Concentration is a process of distraction from less important matters. It is too late to think about the cut of your coat when once you are upon the platform, so center your interest on what you are about to say. Fill your mind with your speech material, and like the infilling water in the glass, it will drive out your unsubstantial fears. Self-consciousness is undue consciousness of self, and for the purpose of delivery, self is secondary to your subject, not only in the opinion of the audience, but if you are wise, in your own. To hold any other view is to regard yourself as an exhibit instead of as a messenger with a message worth delivering. Far worse than self-consciousness through fear of doing poorly is self-consciousness through assumption of doing well. The first sign of greatness is when a person does not attempt to look and act great. Nothing advertises itself so thoroughly as conceit. One may be so full of self as to be empty. Voltaire said, We must conceal self-love. But that cannot be done. You know this to be true, for you have recognized overweening self-love in others. If you have it, others are seeing it in you. There are things in this world bigger than self, and in working for them self will be forgotten, or, what is better, remembered only so as to help us win toward higher things. Have something to say. The trouble with many speakers is that they go before an audience with their minds a blank. It is no wonder that nature, abhorring a vacuum, fills them with the nearest thing handy, which generally happens to be, I wonder if I'm doing this right. How does my hair look? I know I shall fail. Their prophetic souls are sure to be right. It is not enough to be absorbed by your subject. To acquire self-confidence, you must have something in which to be confident. If you go before an audience without any preparation or previous knowledge of your subject, you ought to be self-conscious. You ought to be ashamed to steal the time of your audience. Prepare yourself. Know what you are going to talk about, and in general, how you are going to say it. Have the first few sentences worked out completely so that you may not be troubled in the beginning to find words. Know your subject better than your hearers know it, and you have nothing to fear. After preparing for success, expect it. Let your bearing be modestly confident, but most of all be modestly confident within. Overconfidence is bad, but to tolerate premonitions of failure is worse, for a bold person may win attention by his very bearing, while a rabbit-hearted coward invites disaster. Washington Irving once introduced Charles Dickens at a dinner given in the latter's honor. In the middle of his speech, Irving hesitated, became embarrassed, and sat down awkwardly. Turning to a friend beside him, he remarked, There, I told you I would fail, and I did. If you believe you will fail, there is no hope for you. You will. 
assume mastery over your audience. In public speech, as in electricity, there is a positive and a negative force. Either you or your audience are going to possess the positive factor. If you assume it, you can almost invariably make it yours. If you assume the negative, you are sure to be negative. Assuming a virtue or a vice vitalizes it. Summon all your power of self-direction, and remember that though your audience is infinitely more important than you, the truth is more important than both of you because it is eternal. If your mind falters in its leadership, the sword will drop from your hands. Your assumption of being able to instruct or lead, or inspire a multitude or even a small group of people, may appall you as being colossal impudence, as indeed it may be. But having once essayed to speak, be courageous. Be courageous. It lies within you to be what you will. Make yourself be calm and confident. Reflect that your audience will not hurt you. In facing your audience, pause a moment and look them over. A hundred chances to one they want you to succeed, for what person is so foolish as to spend his time, perhaps his money, in the hope that you will waste his investment by talking dully? Concluding Hints Do not make haste to begin. Haste shows lack of control. Do not apologize. It ought not to be necessary, and if it is, it will not help. Go straight ahead. Take a deep breath, relax, and begin in a quiet conversational tone, as though you were speaking to one large friend. You will not find it half so bad as you imagined. Really, it is like taking a cold plunge. After you are in, the water is fine. In fact, having spoken a few times, you will even anticipate the plunge with exhilaration. To stand before an audience and make them think your thoughts after you is one of the greatest pleasures you can ever know. Instead of fearing it, you ought to be as anxious as the foxhounds straining at their leashes or the racehorses tugging at their reins. So cast out fear, for fear is cowardly, when it is not mastered. The bravest know fear, but they do not yield to it. Face your audience pluckily. If your knees quake, make them stop. In your audience lies some victory for you and the cause you represent. Go win it. The world owes its progress to the people who have dared, and you must dare to speak the effective word that is in your heart to speak, for often it requires courage to utter a single sentence. But remember that people erect no monuments and weave no laurels for those who fear to do what they can. No one doubts that temperament and nerves and illness, and even praiseworthy modesty, may, singly or combined, cause the speaker's cheek to blanch before an audience but neither can anyone doubt that coddling will magnify this weakness. The victory lies in a fearless frame of mind. Chapter 2 Concentration in Delivery Try to rub the top of your head forward and backward at the same time that you were patting your chest. Unless your powers of coordination are well developed, you will find it confusing, if not impossible. The brain needs special training before it can do two or more things efficiently at the same instant. It may seem like splitting a hair between its north and northwest corner, but some psychologists argue that no brain can think two distinct thoughts absolutely simultaneously, that what seems to be simultaneous is really very rapid rotation from the first thought to the second and back again, just as in the above-cited experiment the attention must shift from one hand to the other, until one or the other movement becomes partly or wholly automatic. Whatever is the psychological truth of this contention, it is undeniable that the mind measurably loses grip on one idea the moment the attention is projected decidedly ahead to a second or a third idea. A fault in public speakers that is as pernicious as it is common is that they try to think of the succeeding sentence while still uttering the former, and in this way their concentration trails off, in consequence, they start their sentences strongly and end them weakly. In a well-prepared written speech, the emphatic word usually comes at one end of the sentence, but an emphatic word needs emphatic expression, and this is precisely what it does not get when concentration flags by leaping too soon to that which is next to be uttered. Concentrate all your mental energies on the present sentence. 
Remember that the mind of your audience follows yours very closely, and if you withdraw your attention from what you are saying to what you are going to say, your audience will also withdraw theirs. They may not do so consciously and deliberately, but they will surely cease to give importance to the things that you yourself slight. It is fatal to either the actor or the speaker to cross his bridges too soon. Of course, all this is not to say that in the natural pauses of your speech you are not to take swift forward surveys. They are as important as the forward look in driving a motor car. The caution is of quite another sort. While speaking one sentence, do not think of the sentence to follow. Let it come from its proper source within yourself. You cannot deliver a broadside without concentrated force. That is what produces the explosion. In preparation, you store and concentrate thought and feeling. In the pauses during delivery, you swiftly look ahead and gather yourself for effective attack. During the moments of actual speech, speak, don't anticipate. Divide your attention, and you divide your power. This matter of the effect of the inner person upon the outer needs a further word here, particularly as touching concentration. Why do you read, my lord? Hamlet replied, Words, words, words. That is a world-old trouble. The mechanical calling of words is not expression by a long stretch. Did you ever notice how hollow a memorized speech usually sounds? You have listened to the ranting mechanical cadence of inefficient actors, lawyers, and preachers. Their trouble is a mental one. They are not concentratedly thinking thoughts that cause words to issue with sincerity and conviction, but are merely enunciating word sounds mechanically. Painful experience alike to audience and to speaker. A parrot is equally eloquent. Again, let Shakespeare instruct us, this tune in the insincere prayer of the king, Hamlet's uncle. He laments thus pointedly, My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. The truth is that as a speaker your words must be born again every time they are spoken. Then they will not suffer in their utterance, even though perforce committed to memory and repeated. Such speeches lose nothing by repetition, for the perfectly patent reason that they arise from concentrated thought and feeling, and not a mere necessity for saying something, which usually means anything, and that in turn is tantamount to nothing. If the thought beneath your words is warm, fresh, spontaneous, a part of yourself, your utterance will have breath and life. Words are only a result. Do not try to get the result without stimulating the cause. Do you ask how to concentrate? Think of the word itself and of its philological brother, concentric. Think of how a lens gathers and concenters the rays of light within a given circle. It centers them by a process of withdrawal. It may seem like a harsh saying, but the person who cannot concentrate is either weak of will, a nervous wreck, or has never learned what willpower is good for. You must concentrate by resolutely withdrawing your attention from everything else. If you concentrate your thought on a pain which may be afflicting you, that pain will grow more intense. Count your blessings, and they will multiply. Center your thought on your strokes, and your tennis play will gradually improve. To concentrate is simply to attend to one thing and attend to nothing else. If you find that you cannot do that, there is something wrong. Attend to that first. Remove the cause, and the symptom will disappear. Cultivate your will by willing and then doing at all costs. Concentrate, and you will win. Chapter 3. Feeling and Enthusiasm If you are addressing a body of scientists on such a subject as the veins in a butterfly's wings, or on road structure, Naturally, your theme will not arouse much feeling in either you or your audience. These are purely mental subjects. But if you want people to vote for a measure that will abolish child labor, or if you would inspire them to take up arms for freedom, you must strike straight at their feelings. Our feelings dictate what we shall eat and generally how we shall act. A person is a feeling animal, hence the public speaker's ability to arouse people to action 
depends almost wholly on his ability to touch their emotions. The great speeches of the world have not been delivered on tariff reductions or post office appropriations. The speeches that will live have been charged with emotional force. Prosperity and peace are poor developers of eloquence. When great wrongs are to be righted, when the public heart is flaming with passion, that is the occasion for memorable speaking. Patrick Henry made an immortal address, for in an epical crisis he pleaded for liberty. He had roused himself to the point where he could honestly and passionately exclaim, Give me liberty or give me death! His fame would have been different had he lived today and argued for the recall of judges. The Power of Enthusiasm Political parties hire bands and pay for applause. They argue that for vote-getting, to stir up enthusiasm is more effective than reasoning. How far they are right depends on the hearers, but there can be no doubt about the contagious nature of enthusiasm. Illustrations without number might be cited to show that in all our actions we are emotional beings. The speaker who would speak efficiently must develop the power to arouse feeling. Webster, great debater that he was, knew that the real secret of a speaker's power was an emotional one. He eloquently says of eloquence, Affected passion, intense expression, the pomp of declamation, all may aspire after it. They cannot reach it. It comes, if it come at all, like the outbreak of a fountain from the earth, or the bursting forth of volcanic fires, with spontaneous, original, native force. The graces taught in the schools, the costly ornaments and studied contrivances of speech, shock and disgust people when their own lives and the fate of their wives, their children, and their country hang on the decision of the hour. Then words have lost their power, rhetoric is in vain, and all elaborate oratory contemptible. Even genius itself then feels rebuked and subdued, as in the presence of higher qualities. Then patriotism is eloquent, then self-devotion is eloquent. The clear conception outrunning the deductions of logic, the high purpose, the firm resolve, the dauntless spirit, speaking on the tongue, beaming from the eye, informing every feature, and urging the whole person onward, right onward to his subject, this, this is eloquence, or rather it is something greater and higher than all eloquence. It is action, noble, sublime, godlike action. Emerson said, Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Carlyle declared that every great movement in the annals of history has been the triumph of enthusiasm. It is as contagious as measles. Eloquence is half inspiration. Sweep your audience with you in a pulsation of enthusiasm. Let yourself go. A man, said Oliver Cromwell, never rises so high as when he knows not whither he is going. How are we to acquire and develop enthusiasm? There is only one way to get feeling into your speaking, and whatever else you forget, forget not this. You must actually enter into the character you impersonate, the cause you advocate, the case you argue, enter into it so deeply that it clothes you, enthralls you, possesses you wholly. Then you are, in the true meaning of the word, in sympathy with your subject, for its feeling is your feeling, you feel with it, and therefore your enthusiasm is both genuine and contagious. Genuine feeling in a speech is bone and blood of the speech itself, and not something that may be added to it or subtracted at will. In the ideal address theme, speaker and audience become one, fused by the emotion and thought of the hour. THE NEED OF SYMPATHY FOR HUMANITY The seal and sign of greatness is a desire to serve others. Self-preservation is the first law of life, but self-abnegation is the first law of greatness and of art. Selfishness is the fundamental cause of all sin. It is the thing that all great religions, all worthy philosophies have struck at. Out of a heart of real sympathy and love come the speeches that move humanity. As Daniel Webster said, it is of no use to try to pretend to sympathy your feelings. It cannot be done successfully. Nature is forever putting a premium on reality. 
What is false is soon detected as such. The thoughts and feelings that create and mold the speech in the study must be born again when the speech is delivered from the platform. Do not let your words say one thing and your voice and attitude another. There is no room here for half-hearted, nonchalant methods of delivery. Sincerity is the very soul of eloquence. Chapter 4 Fluency Through Preparation Take your dictionary and look up the words that contain the Latin stem flu. The results will be suggestive. At first blush, it would seem that fluency consists in a ready, easy use of words. Not so. The flowing quality of speech is much more, for it is a composite effect, with each of its prior conditions deserving of careful notice. The Sources of Fluency Speaking broadly, fluency is almost entirely a matter of preparation. Have you ever stopped to analyze that expression, a ready speaker? Readiness in its prime sense is preparedness, and they are most ready who are best prepared. Quick firing depends more on the alert finger than on the hair trigger. Your fluency will be in direct ratio to two important conditions, your knowledge of what you are going to say, and your being accustomed to telling what you know to an audience. This gives us the second great element of fluency. To preparation must be added the ease that arises from practice, of which more presently. Knowledge is essential. Do not expect to speak fluently on a subject that you know little or nothing about. But preparation goes beyond the getting of the facts in the case you are to present. It includes also the ability to think and arrange your thoughts, a full and precise vocabulary, an easy manner of speech and breathing, absence of self-consciousness, and the several other characteristics of efficient delivery that have deserved special attention in other parts of this book, rather than in this chapter. Preparation may be either general or specific. Usually it should be both. A lifetime of reading, of companionship with stirring thoughts, of wrestling with the problems of life, this constitutes a general preparation of inestimable worth. Out of a well-stored mind, and richer still, a broad experience, and, best of all, a warmly sympathetic heart, the speaker will have to draw much material that no immediate study could provide. The speaker who would speak fluently before an audience should learn to speak fluently and entertainingly with a friend. Clarify your ideas by putting them in words. The talker gains as much from his conversation as the listener. You sometimes begin to converse on a subject thinking you have very little to say, but one idea gives birth to another, and you were surprised to learn that the more you give, the more you have to give. This give and take of friendly conversation develops mentality and fluency in expression. Longfellow said, A single conversation across the table with a wise man is better than ten years' study of books. And Holmes whimsically yet nonetheless truthfully declared that half the time he talked to find out what he thought but that method must not be applied on the platform. Practice But preparation must also be of another sort than the gathering, organizing, and shaping of materials. It must include practice, which, like mental preparation, must be both general and special. Do not feel surprised or discouraged if practice on the principles of delivery herein laid down seems to retard your fluency, for a time, this will be inevitable. While you are working for proper inflection, for instance, inflection will be demanding your first thoughts, and the flow of your speech, for the time being, will be secondary. This warning, however, is strictly for the closet, for your practice at home. Do not carry any thoughts of inflection with you to the platform. There you must think only of your subject. There is an absolute telepathy between the audience and the speaker. If your thought goes to your gesture, their thought will too. If your interest goes to the quality of your voice, they will be regarding that instead of what your voice is uttering. You have doubtless been adjured to forget everything but your subject. This advice says either too much or too little. The truth is that while on the platform you must not forget a great many things that are not in your subject, but you must not think of them. 
Your attention must consciously go only to your message, but subconsciously you will be attending to the points of technique which have become more or less habitual by practice. A nice balance between these two kinds of attention is important. You can no more escape this law than you can live without air. Your platform gestures, your voice, your inflection will all be just as good as your habit of gesture, voice, and inflection makes them. No better. Even the thought of whether you were speaking fluently or not will have the effect of marring your flow of speech. Return to the opening chapter on self-confidence and again lay its precepts to heart. Learn by rules to speak without thinking of rules. It is not or ought not to be necessary for you to stop to think how to say the alphabet correctly. As a matter of fact, it is slightly more difficult for you to repeat ZYX than it is to say XYZ. Habit has established the order. Just so, you must master the laws of efficiency in speaking until it is a second nature for you to speak correctly rather than otherwise. A beginner at the piano has a great deal of trouble with the mechanics of playing, but as time goes on, his fingers become trained and almost instinctively wander over the keys correctly. As an inexperienced speaker, you will find a great deal of difficulty at first in putting principles into practice, for you will be scared like the young swimmer and make some crude strokes, but if you persevere, you will win out. Thus to sum up, the vocabulary you have enlarged by study, the ease in speaking you have developed by practice, the economy of your well-studied emphasis, all will subconsciously come to your aid on the platform. Then the habits you have formed will be earning you a splendid dividend. The fluency of your speech will be at the speed of flow your practice has made habitual. But this means work. What good habit does not? No philosopher's stone that will act as a substitute for laborious practice has ever been found. If it were, it would be thrown away because it would kill our greatest joy, the delight of acquisition. If public speaking means to you a fuller life, you will know no greater happiness than a well-spoken speech. The time you have spent in gathering ideas and in private practice of speaking, you will find amply rewarded. Chapter 5 the Voice The dramatic critic of the London Times once declared that acting is nine-tenths voice work. Leaving the message aside, the same may justly be said of public speaking. A rich, correctly used voice is the greatest physical factor of persuasiveness and power, often overtopping the effects of reason. But a good voice, well handled, is not only an effective possession for the professional speaker, it is a mark of personal culture as well, and even a distinct commercial asset. There are three fundamental requisites for a good voice. 1. Ease The secret of good voice is relaxation. The airwaves that produce voice result in a different kind of tone when striking against relaxed muscles than when striking constricted muscles. Try this for yourself. Contract the muscles of your face and throat as you do in hate and flame out, I hate you! Now relax as you do when thinking gentle, tender thoughts and say, I love you. How different the voice sounds. In practicing voice exercises and in speaking, never force your tones. Ease must be your watchword. The voice is a delicate instrument and you must not handle it with hammer and tongs. Don't make your voice go. Let it go. Don't work. Let the yoke of speech be easy and its burden light. Your throat should be free from strain during speech. Therefore, it is necessary to avoid muscular contraction. The throat must act as a sort of chimney or funnel for the voice. Hence, any unnatural constriction will not only harm its tones, but injure its health. Nervousness and mental strain are common sources of mouth and throat constriction. So make the battle for poise and self-confidence for which we pleaded in the opening chapter. But how can I relax, you ask? By simply willing to relax. Hold your arm out straight from your shoulder. Now, withdraw all power and let it fall. Practice relaxation of the muscles of the throat by letting your neck and head fall forward. Roll the upper part of your body around, with the waistline acting as a pivot, 
let your head fall and roll around as you shift the torso to different positions. Do not force your head around. Simply relax your neck and let gravity pull it around as your body moves. Again, let your head fall forward on your breast. Raise your head, letting your jaw hang. Relax until your jaw feels heavy, as though it were a weight hung to your face. Remember, you must relax the jaw to obtain command of it. It must be free and flexible for the molding of tone, and to let the tone pass out unobstructed. All the activity of breathing must be centered not in the throat, but in the middle of the body. You must breathe from the diaphragm. Note the way you breathe when lying flat on the back, undressed in bed. You will observe that all the activity then centers around the diaphragm. This is the natural and correct method of breathing. By constant watchfulness, make this your habitual manner, for it will enable you to relax more perfectly the muscles of the throat. The next fundamental requisite for good voice is, two, openness. If the muscles of the throat are constricted, the tone passage partially closed, and the mouth kept half shut, how can you expect the tone to come out bright and clear, or even to come out at all? Sound is a series of waves, and if you make a prison of your mouth, holding the jaws and lips rigidly, it will be very difficult for the tone to squeeze through, and even when it does escape, it will lack force and carrying power. Open your mouth wide, relax all the organs of speech, and let the tone flow out easily. Start to yawn, but instead of yawning, speak while your throat is open. Make this open feeling habitual when speaking. We say make because it is a matter of resolution and of practice if your vocal organs are healthy. The final fundamental requisite for good voice is 3. Forwardness. A voice that is pitched back in the throat is dark, somber, and unattractive. The tone must be pitched forward, but do not force it forward. You will recall that our first principle was ease. Think the tone forward and out. Believe it is going forward, and allow it to flow easily. You can tell whether you were placing your tone forward or not by inhaling a deep breath and singing ah with the mouth wide open, trying to feel the little delicate sound waves strike the bony arch of the mouth just above the front teeth. The sensation is so slight that you will probably not be able to detect it at once, but persevere in your practice, always thinking the tone forward, and you will be rewarded by feeling your voice strike the roof of your mouth. A correct forward placing of the tone will do away with the dark, throaty tones that are so unpleasant, inefficient, and harmful to the throat. Close the lips, humming ng, im, or an. Think the tone forward. Do you feel it strike the lips? Hold the palm of your hand in front of your face and say vigorously, crash, dash, whirl, buzz. Can you feel the forward tones strike against your hand? Practice until you can. Remember, the only way to get your voice forward is to put it forward. How to develop the carrying power of the voice. It is not necessary to speak loudly in order to be heard at a distance. It is necessary only to speak correctly. Edith Wynne Matheson's voice will carry in a whisper throughout a large theater. A paper rustling on the stage of a large auditorium can be heard distinctly in the furthermost seat in the gallery. If you will only use your voice correctly, you will not have much difficulty in being heard. Of course, it is always well to address your speech to your furthest auditors. If they get it, those nearer will have no trouble. But aside from this obvious suggestion, you must observe these laws of voice production. Remember to apply the principles of ease, openness, and forwardness. They are the prime factors in enabling your voice to be heard at a distance. Do not gaze at the floor as you talk. This habit not only gives the speaker an amateurish appearance, but if the head is hung forward, the voice will be directed towards the ground instead of floating out over the audience. Voice is a series of air vibrations. To strengthen it, two things are necessary more air or breath, and more vibration. Breath is the very basis of voice. 
as a bullet with little powder behind it will not have force and carrying power, so the voice that has little breath behind it will be weak. Not only will deep breathing, breathing from the diaphragm, give the voice a better support, but it will give it a stronger resonance by improving the general health. Usually, ill health means a weak voice, while abundant physical vitality is shown through a strong, vibrant voice. Therefore, anything that improves the general vitality is an excellent voice strengthener, provided you use the voice properly. Authorities differ on most of the rules of hygiene, but on one point they all agree. Vitality and longevity are increased by deep breathing. Practice this until it becomes second nature. Whenever you are speaking, take in deep breaths, but in such a manner that the inhalations will be silent. Do not try to speak too long without renewing your breath. Nature cares for this pretty well unconsciously in conversation, and she will do the same for you in platform speaking if you do not interfere with her premonitions. A certain very successful speaker developed voice-carrying power by running across country, practicing his speeches as he went. The vigorous exercise forced him to take deep breaths and developed lung power. A hard-fought basketball or tennis game is an efficient way of practicing deep breathing. When these methods are not convenient, we recommend the following. Place your hands at your sides on the waistline. By trying to encompass your waist with your fingers and thumbs, force all the air out of the lungs. Take a deep breath. Remember, all the activity is to be centered in the middle of the body. Do not raise the shoulders. As the breath is taken, your hands will be forced out. Repeat the exercise, placing your hands on the small of the back and forcing them out as you inhale. Many methods for deep breathing have been given by various authorities. Get the air into your lungs. That is the important thing. The body acts as a sounding board for the voice, just as the body of the violin acts as a sounding board for its tones. You can increase its vibrations by practice. Place your finger on your lip and hum the musical scale, thinking and placing the voice forward on the lips. Do you feel the lips vibrate? After a little practice, they will vibrate, giving a tickling sensation. Repeat this exercise, throwing the humming sound into the nose. Hold the upper part of the nose between the thumb and forefinger. Can you feel the nose vibrate? Placing the palm of your hand on top of your head, repeat this humming exercise. Think the voice there as you hum in head tones. Can you feel the vibration there? Now place the palm of your hand on the back of your head, repeating the foregoing process. Then try it on the chest. Always remember to think your tone where you desire to feel the vibrations. The mere act of thinking about any portion of your body will tend to make it vibrate. Repeat the following after a deep inhalation, endeavoring to feel all portions of your body vibrate at the same time. When you have attained this, you will find that it is a pleasant sensation. What ho, my jovial mates! Come on! We will frolic it like fairies, frisking in the merry moonshine. Purity of Voice This quality is sometimes destroyed by wasting the breath. Carefully control the breath, using only as much as is necessary for the production of tone. Utilize all that you give out. Failure to do this results in a breathy tone. Take in breath like a prodigal. In speaking, give it out like a miser. Voice Suggestions Never attempt to force your voice when hoarse. Do not drink cold water when speaking. The sudden shock to the heated organs of speech will injure the voice. Avoid pitching your voice too high. It will make it raspy. This is a common fault. When you find your voice in too high a range, lower it. Do not wait until you get to the platform to try this. Practice it in your daily conversation. Repeat the alphabet, beginning A on the lowest scale possible and going up a note on each succeeding letter, for the development of range. A wide range will give you facility in making numerous changes of pitch. Do not form the habit of listening to your voice when speaking. You will need your brain to think of what you were saying. Reserve your observation for private practice. Chapter 6 The Truth About Gesture 
gesture is really a simple matter that requires observation and common sense rather than a book of rules. Gesture is an outward expression of an inward condition. It is merely an effect, the effect of a mental or an emotional impulse struggling for expression through physical avenues. You must not, however, begin at the wrong end. If you are troubled by your gestures or a lack of gestures, attend to the cause, not the effect. It will not in the least help matters to tack on to your delivery a few mechanical movements. If the tree in your front yard is not growing to suit you, fertilize and water the soil and let the tree have sunshine. Obviously, it will not help your tree to nail on a few branches. If your cistern is dry, wait until it rains or bore a well. Why plunge a pump into a dry hole? The speaker, whose thoughts and emotions are welling within him like a mountain spring, will not have much trouble to make gestures. It will be merely a question of properly directing them. If his enthusiasm for his subject is not such as to give him a natural impulse for dramatic action, it will avail nothing to furnish him with a long list of rules. He may tack on some movements, but they will look like the wilted branches nailed to a tree to simulate life. Gestures must be born, not built. A wooden horse may amuse the children, but it takes a live one to go somewhere. It is not only impossible to lay down definite rules on this subject, but it would be silly to try, for everything depends on the speech, the occasion, the personality and feelings of the speaker, and the attitude of the audience. It is easy enough to forecast the result of multiplying seven by six, but it is impossible to tell any person what kind of gestures he will be impelled to use when he wishes to show his earnestness. We may tell him that many speakers, pointing straight at the audience, pour out their thoughts like a volley, or that others stamp one foot for emphasis. Any gesture that merely calls attention to itself is bad. The purpose of a gesture is to carry your thought and feeling into the minds and hearts of your hearers. This it does by emphasizing your message, by interpreting it, by expressing it in action, by striking its tone in either a physically descriptive, a suggestive, or a typical gesture, and let it be remembered all the time that gesture includes all physical movement, from facial expression and the tossing of the head to the expressive movements of hand and foot. A shifting of the pose may be a most effective gesture. What is true of gesture is true of all life. If the people on the street turn around and watch your walk, your walk is more important than you are. Change it. If the attention of your audience is called to your gestures, they are not convincing because they appear to be what they have a doubtful right to be in reality, studied. Have you ever seen a speaker use such grotesque gesticulations that you were fascinated by their frenzy of oddity but could not follow his thought? Do not smother ideas with gymnastics. Only when gesture is subordinated to the absorbing importance of the idea, a spontaneous living expression of living truth, is it justifiable at all and when it is remembered for itself, as a piece of unusual physical energy or as a poem of grace, it is a dead failure as dramatic expression. There is a place for a unique style of walking. It is the circus or the cake walk. There is a place for surprisingly rhythmical evolutions of arms and legs. It is on the dance floor or the stage. Don't let your agility and grace put your thoughts out of business. One of the present writers took his first lessons in gesture from a certain college president who knew far more about what had happened at the Diet of Worms than he did about how to express himself in action. His instructions were to start the movement on a certain word, continue it on a precise curve, and unfold the fingers at the conclusion, ending with the forefinger, just so. Plenty, and more than plenty, has been published on this subject, giving just such silly directions. Gesture is a thing of mentality and feeling, not a matter of geometry. Remember, whenever a pair of shoes, a method of pronunciation, or a gesture calls attention to itself, it is bad. When you have made really good gestures in a good speech, your hearers will not go away saying, What beautiful gestures he made! But they will say, I'll vote for that measure. He is right. I believe in that. Gestures should be born of the moment. The best actors and public speakers rarely know in advance what gestures they are going to make. 
They make one gesture on certain words tonight, and none at all tomorrow night at the same point. Their various moods and interpretations govern their gestures. It is all a matter of impulse and intelligent feeling with them. Don't overlook that word intelligent. Nature does not always provide the same kind of sunsets or snowflakes, and the movements of a good speaker vary almost as much as the creations of nature. Now all this is not to say that you must not take some thought for your gestures. If that were meant, why this chapter? When the sergeant despairingly besought the recruit in the awkward squad to step out and look at himself, he gave splendid advice and worthy of personal application. Particularly while you were in the learning days of public speaking, you must learn to criticize your own gestures. Recall them, see where they were useless, crude, awkward, what not, and do better next time. There is a vast deal of difference between being conscious of self and being self-conscious. It will require your nice discrimination in order to cultivate spontaneous gestures and yet give due attention to practice. While you depend upon the moment, it is vital to remember that only a dramatic genius can effectively accomplish such feats, and doubtless the first time they were used they came in a burst of spontaneous feeling. What spontaneity initiates, let practice complete. Every effective speaker and every vivid actor has observed, considered, and practiced gesture until his dramatic actions are a subconscious possession, just like his ability to pronounce correctly without especially concentrating his thought. Every able platform person has possessed himself of a dozen ways in which he might depict in gesture any given emotion. In fact, the means for such expression are endless, and this is precisely why it is both useless and harmful to make a chart of gestures and enforce them as the ideals of what may be used to express this or that feeling. Practice descriptive, suggestive, and typical movements until they come as naturally as a good articulation, and rarely forecast the gestures you will use at a given moment. Leave something to that moment. Avoid monotony in gesture. Roast beef is an excellent dish, but it would be terrible as an exclusive diet. No matter how effective one gesture is, do not overwork it. Put variety in your actions. Monotony will destroy all beauty and power. The pump handle makes one effective gesture, and on hot days that one is very eloquent, but it has its limitations. Any movement that is not significant weakens. Do not forget that. Restlessness is not expression. A great many useless movements will only take the attention of the audience from what you were saying. A widely noted person introduced the speaker of the evening one Sunday lately to a New York audience. The only thing remembered about that introductory speech is that the speaker played nervously with the covering of the table as he talked. We naturally watch moving objects. By making a few movements at one side of the stage, a chorus girl may draw the interest of the spectators from a big scene between the leads. When our forefathers lived in caves, they had to watch moving objects, for movements meant danger. We have not yet overcome the habit. Advertisers have taken advantage of it. Witness the moving electric light signs in any city. A shrewd speaker will respect this law and conserve the attention of his audience by eliminating all unnecessary movements. Gesture should either be simultaneous with or precede the words, not follow them. Lady Macbeth says, Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Reverse this order and you get comedy. Say, There he goes, pointing at him after you have finished your words, and see if the result is not comical. Do not make short, jerky movements. Some speakers seem to be imitating a waiter who has failed to get a tip. Let your movements be easy and from the shoulder, as a rule, rather than from the elbow. But do not go to the other extreme and make too many flowing motions. That savors of the lackadaisical. Put a little punch and life into your gestures. You cannot, however, do this mechanically. The audience will detect it if you do. They may not know just what is wrong, but the gesture will have a false appearance to them. Facial expression is important. Have you ever stopped in front of a Broadway theater and looked at the photographs of the cast? Notice the row of chorus girls who were supposed to be expressing fear. 
Their attitudes are so mechanical that the attempt is ridiculous. Notice the picture of the star expressing the same emotion. His muscles are drawn, his eyebrows lifted, he shrinks, and fear shines through his eyes. That actor felt fear when the photograph was taken. The movements of the facial muscles may mean a great deal more than the movements of the hand. The person who sits in a dejected heap with a look of despair on his face is expressing his thoughts and feelings just as effectively as the person who is waving his arms and shouting. The eye has been called the window of the soul. Through it shines the light of our thoughts and feelings. Do not use too much gesture. As a matter of fact, in the big crises of life, we do not go through many actions. When your closest friend dies, you do not throw up your hands and talk about your grief. You are more likely to sit and brood in dry-eyed silence. The writer once observed an instructor drilling a class in gesture. They had come to the passage from Henry VIII in which the Humboldt Cardinal says, Farewell, a long farewell to all my greatness. It is one of the pathetic passages of literature. A person uttering such a sentiment would be crushed, and the last thing on earth he would do would be to make flamboyant movements. Yet this class had an elocutionary manual before them that gave an appropriate gesture for every occasion, from paying the gas bill to deathbed farewells. So they were instructed to throw their arms out at full length on each side and say, Farewell, a long farewell to all my greatness. Such a gesture might possibly be used in an after-dinner speech at the convention of a telephone company whose lines extended from the Atlantic to the Pacific, but to think of Wolsey's using that movement would suggest that his fate was just. Posture The physical attitude to be taken before an audience really is included in gesture. Just what the attitude should be depends not on rules, but on the spirit of the speech and the occasion. Senator La Follette stood for three hours with his weight thrown on his forward foot as he leaned out over the footlights, ran his fingers through his hair, and flamed out a denunciation of the trusts. It was very effective. But imagine a speaker taking that kind of position to discourse on the development of road-making machinery. If you have a fiery, aggressive message and will let yourself go, nature will naturally pull your weight to your forward foot. A person in a hot political argument or a street brawl never has to stop to think upon which foot he should throw his weight. You may sometimes place your weight on your back foot if you have a restful and calm message. But don't worry about it. Just stand like a person who genuinely feels what he is saying. Do not stand with your heels close together like a soldier or a butler. No more should you stand with them wide apart like a traffic policeman. Use simple good manners and common sense. Here a word of caution is needed. We have advised you to allow your gestures and postures to be spontaneous and not woodenly prepared beforehand, but do not go to the extreme of ignoring the importance of acquiring mastery of your physical movements. A muscular hand made flexible by free movement is far more likely to be an effective instrument in gesture than a stiff, pudgy bunch of fingers. If your shoulders are lithe and carried well, while your chest does not retreat from association with your chin, the chances of using good extemporaneous gestures are so much the better. Learn to keep the back of your neck touching your collar, hold your chest high, and keep down your waist measure. So attention to strength, poise, flexibility, and grace of body are the foundations of good gesture, for they are expressions of vitality, and without vitality no speaker can enter the kingdom of power. When an awkward giant like Abraham Lincoln rose to the sublimest heights of oratory, he did so because of the greatness of his soul. His very ruggedness of spirit and artless honesty were properly expressed in his gnarly body. The fire of character, of earnestness, and of message swept his hearers before him, when the tepid words of an insincere Apollo would have left no effect. But be sure you are a second Lincoln before you despise the handicap of physical awkwardness. If you would learn to stand well before an audience, look at yourself in a mirror, but not too often. Practice walking and standing before the mirror so as to conquer awkwardness, not to cultivate a pose. Stand on the platform in the same easy manner that you would use before guests in a drawing room. 
If your position is not graceful, make it so by dancing, gymnasium work, and by getting grace and poise in your mind. Do not continually hold the same position. Any big change of thought necessitates a change of position. Be at home. There are no rules. It is all a matter of taste. When on the platform, forget that you have any hands until you desire to use them. Then remember them effectively. Gravity will take care of them. Of course, if you want to put them behind you or fold them once in a while, it is not going to ruin your speech. Thought and feeling are the big things in speaking, not the position of a foot or a hand. Simply put your limbs where you want them to be. You have a will, so do not neglect to use it. Let us reiterate, do not despise practice. Your gestures and movements may be spontaneous and still be wrong. No matter how natural they are, it is possible to improve them. It is impossible for anyone, even yourself, to criticize your gestures until after they are made. You can't prune a peach tree until it comes up, therefore speak much and observe your own speech. While you are examining yourself, do not forget to study statuary and paintings to see how the great portrayers of nature have made their subjects express ideas through action. Notice the gestures of the best speakers and actors. Observe the physical expression of life everywhere. The leaves on the tree respond to the slightest breeze. The muscles of your face, the light of your eyes, should respond to the slightest change of feeling. Emerson says, Every man that I meet is my superior in some way. In that I learn of him. Open your eyes. Emerson says again, We are immersed in beauty, but our eyes have no clear vision. Toss this book to one side, go out and watch one child plead with another for a bite of apple, see a street brawl, observe life in action. Do you want to know how to express victory? Watch the victor's hands go high on election night. Do you want to plead a cause? Make a composite photograph of all the pleaders in daily life you constantly see. Beg, borrow, and steal the best you can get, but don't give it out as theft. Assimilate it until it becomes a part of you. Then let the expression come out. Chapter 7 Methods of Delivery the crown, the consummation of the discourse, is its delivery. Toward it all preparation looks, for it the audience waits, by it the speaker is judged. All the forces of the orator's life converge in his oratory. The logical acuteness with which he marshals the facts around his theme, the rhetorical facility with which he orders his language, the control to which he has attained in the use of his body as a single organ of expression, whatever richness of acquisition and experience are his. These all are now incidents. The fact is the sending of his message home to his hearers. The hour of delivery is the supreme, inevitable hour for the orator. It is this fact that makes lack of adequate preparation such an impertinence, and it is this that sends such thrills of indescribable joy through the orator's whole being when he has achieved a success. It is like the mother forgetting her pangs for the joy of bringing a son into the world. There are four fundamental methods of delivering an address. All others are modifications of one or more of these. Reading from manuscript, committing the written speech and speaking from memory, speaking from notes, and extemporaneous speech. It is impossible to say which form of delivery is best for all speakers in all circumstances, in deciding for yourself, you should consider the occasion, the nature of the audience, the character of your subject, and your own limitations of time and ability. However, it is worthwhile warning you not to be lenient in self-exaction. Say to yourself courageously, What others can do, I can attempt. A bold spirit conquers where others flinch, and a trying task challenges pluck. Reading from Manuscript this method really deserves short shrift in a book on public speaking, for, delude yourself as you may, public reading is not public speaking. Yet there are so many who grasp this broken reed for support that we must here discuss the red speech, 
apologetic misnomer as it is. Certainly there are occasions, among them the opening of Congress, the presentation of a sore question before a deliberative body, or a historical commemoration, when it may not seem alone to the orator but to all those interested that the chief thing is to express certain thoughts in precise language, in language that must not be either misunderstood or misquoted. At such times, oratory is unhappily elbowed to a back bench, the manuscript is solemnly withdrawn from the capacious inner pocket of the new frock coat, and everyone settles himself resignedly, with only a feeble flicker of hope that the so-called speech may not be as long as it is thick. The words may be golden, but the hearer's eyes are prone to be leaden, and in about one instance out of a hundred does the perpetrator really deliver an impressive address. His excuse is his apology. He is not to be blamed, as a rule, for someone decreed that it would be dangerous to cut loose from manuscript moorings and take his audience with him on a really delightful sail. One great trouble on such great occasions is that the essayist, for such he is, has been chosen not because of his speaking ability, but because his grandfather fought in a certain battle, or his constituents sent him to Congress, or his gifts in some line of endeavor other than speaking have distinguished him as well choose a surgeon from his ability to play golf. To be sure, it always interests an audience to see a great person. Because of his eminence, they are likely to listen to his words with respect, perhaps with interest, even when droned from a manuscript. But how much more effective such a deliverance would be if the papers were cast aside. Regardless of what the theories may be about manuscript delivery, the fact remains that it does not work out with efficiency. Avoid it whenever at all possible. Committing the written speech and speaking from memory. This method has certain points in its favor. If you have time and leisure, it is possible to polish and rewrite your ideas until they are expressed in clear, concise terms. Pope sometimes spent a whole day in perfecting one couplet. Gibbon consumed twenty years gathering material for and rewriting the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Although you cannot devote such painstaking preparation to a speech, you should take time to eliminate useless words, crowd whole paragraphs into a sentence, and choose proper illustrations. Good speeches, like plays, are not written. They are rewritten. The method of writing and committing has been adopted by many speakers. The wonderful effects achieved by famous actors are, of course, accomplished through the delivery of memorized lines. The inexperienced speaker must be warned before attempting this method of delivery that is difficult and trying. It requires much skill to make it efficient. The memorized lines of the young speaker will usually sound like memorized words and repel. If you want to hear an example, listen to a department store demonstrator repeat her memorized lingo. It requires training to make a memorized speech sound fresh and spontaneous, and, unless you have a fine native memory, in each instance the finished product necessitates much labor. Should you forget a part of your speech or miss a few words, you are liable to be so confused that, like Mark Twain's guide in Rome, you will be compelled to repeat your lines from the beginning. On the other hand, you may be so taken up with trying to recall your written words that you will not abandon yourself to the spirit of your address and so fail to deliver it with that spontaneity which is so vital to forceful delivery. But do not let these difficulties frighten you. If committing seems best to you, give it a faithful trial. Do not be deterred by its pitfalls, but by resolute practice avoid them. One of the best ways to rise superior to these difficulties is to commit without writing the speech, making practically all the preparation mentally, without putting pen to paper, a laborious but effective way of cultivating both mind and memory. You will find it excellent practice, both for memory and delivery, to commit the specimen speeches found in this volume and to claim them, with all attention to the principles we have put before you. Speaking from Notes The third and the most popular method of delivery is probably also the best one for the beginner. Speaking from Notes is not ideal delivery, but we learn to swim in shallow water before going out beyond the ropes. Make a definite plan for your discourse, 
and set down the points somewhat in the fashion of a lawyer's brief or a preacher's outline. Roman numeral five, conclusion, the consequences of inattention and of attention. Few briefs would be so precise as this one, for with experience a speaker learns to use little tricks to attract his eye. He may underscore a catchword heavily, draw a red circle around a pivotal idea, enclose the keyword of an anecdote in a wavy-lined box, and so on indefinitely. These points are worth remembering, for nothing so eludes the swift-glancing eye of the speaker as the sameness of typewriting, or even a regular pen script. So unintentional a thing as a blot on the page may help you to remember a big point in your brief, perhaps by association of ideas. An inexperienced speaker would probably require fuller notes than the specimen given, yet that way lies danger, for the complete manuscript is but a short remove from the copious outline. Use as few notes as possible. They may be necessary for the time being, but do not fail to look upon them as a necessary evil, and even when you lay them before you, refer to them only when compelled to do so. Make your notes as full as you please in preparation, but by all means condense them for platform use. Extemporaneous Speech Surely this is the ideal method of delivery. It is far and away the most popular with the audience, and the favorite method of the most efficient speakers. Extemporaneous speech has sometimes been made to mean unprepared speech, and indeed it is too often precisely that, but in no such sense do we recommend it strongly to speakers old and young. On the contrary, to speak well without notes requires preparation, while yet relying upon the inspiration of the hour for some of your thoughts and much of your language. You had better remember, however, that the most effective inspiration of the hour is the inspiration you yourself bring to it, bottled up in your spirit and ready to infuse itself into the audience. If you extemporize, you can get much closer to your audience. In a sense, they appreciate the task you have before you and send out their sympathy. Extemporize, and you will not have to stop and fumble around amidst your notes. You can keep your eye afire with your message and hold your audience with your very glance. You yourself will feel their response as you read the effects of your warm, spontaneous words written on their countenances. Sentences written out in the study are liable to be dead and cold when resurrected before the audience. When you create as you speak, you can serve all the native fire of your thought. You can enlarge on one point or omit another, just as the occasion or the mood of the audience may demand. It is not possible for every speaker to use this the most difficult of all methods of delivery, and least of all can it be used successfully without much practice, but it is the ideal towards which all should strive. One danger in this method is that you may be led aside from your subject into bypaths. To avoid this peril, firmly stick to your mental outline. Practice speaking from a memorized brief until you gain control. Join a debating society. Talk, 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 and always extemporize. You may make a fool of yourself once or twice, but is that too great a price to pay for success? Notes like crutches are only a sign of weakness. Remember that the power of your speech depends to some extent upon the view your audience holds of you. If you would appear in the light of an authority, be one. Make notes on your brain instead of on paper. Joint Methods of Delivery A modification of the second method has been adopted by many great speakers, particularly lecturers who are compelled to speak on a wide variety of subjects day after day. Such speakers often commit their addresses to memory, but keep their manuscripts in flexible book form before them, turning several pages at a time. They feel safer for having a sheet anchor to windward, but it is an anchor nevertheless, and hinders rapid free sailing though it drag ever so lightly. Other speakers throw out a still lighter anchor by keeping before them a rather full outline of their written and committed speech. Others again write and commit a few important parts of the address, the introduction, the conclusion, some vital argument, some pat illustration, and depend on the hour for the language of the rest. This method is well adapted to speaking either with or without notes. Some speakers read from manuscript the most important parts of their speeches and utter the rest extemporaneously. 
Thus what we have called joint methods of delivery are open to much personal variation. You must decide for yourself which is best for you, for the occasion, for your subject, for your audience. For these four factors all have their individual claims. Whatever form you choose, do not be so weakly indifferent as to prefer the easy way. Choose the best way, whatever it costs you in time and effort. And of this be assured, only the practiced speaker can hope to gain both conciseness of argument and conviction in manner, polish of language and power in delivery, finish of style and fire in utterance.